Has anybody ever seen the show So You Think You Can Dance? You see, just put your hand above you. Say, okay, so maybe it's So You Think You Can Dance, or maybe it's America's Got Talent, or American Idol, or X Factor, or one of those. And, and you guys know the premise. You've got this show when people audition right? And, and I mean, there's some, some really amazing dancers and singers and performers and all of that. But yeah, 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 whatever. What do we really like to see? We like to see the people that are terrible, don't we? Like, these auditions are awful. It's like, you can't dance, and I don't care what your mama told you. She lied to you, <laughs> right? I mean, really, those, and, and I, I, I was like, you know what, I think it's going to be fun. I'll search for a, a clip on YouTube that's got a bunch of terrible auditions, and we'll, we'll just make fun of those people and laugh at them. I don't know if you're supposed to do that in church, but we were going to do it. But everyone I found, here's, here's how it goes. They go up there, and they give their best effort, and it's like, I'm pretty sure they put all of about 12 minutes into rehearsing that thing, and, it, and it's a disaster and what's the judge's job? Is the judge's job to sugarcoat it and, well, you know, that was really good, but I don't think you're the right cup for us. No, what do the judges do? They're brutally honest, like, like Simon. You ever watch Simon? Oh, my goodness. That dude's, like, brutally honest. I love it, right? And so every one of these clips that I watched, it was like it, it, the same thing would happen every time. Awful audition. The judges would be completely honest it would make the person auditioning upset, and then they would cuss out the judges. And I was like, I'm pretty sure I can't show that in church. So I'm sorry, I have no video clip for you. But I wanted us to think about just the show, So You Think You Can Dance. And so my message title for today is, So You Think You Can Christian. So you think you can, you like that? Isn't that cool? So you think you can Christian. So we're going to dig into this. Um, last week, we asked a really big question. And, and the question was this. How would the enemy attack, distract, break down, or destroy a society? And we're assuming this society uh, is like the, the U.S. It has, you know, was founded upon biblical values. Now, granted, we are starting to stray away from some of those. And so we took a look last week into... What would the enemy do if he really wanted to pull us away from those biblical values? What would he do? What are some things that we can look out into our world and see in which he is pulling us away from those biblical values? And we named a whole bunch of things. I even took the, the leap of faith to ask you guys for some answers, and you guys gave some great answers. But we said some things like, well, the enemy would... Uh, attack marriages and families, and we can see him doing that. Uh, he would subtly promote lawlessness. Uh, the enemy would legalize and downplay drugs. Uh, the enemy would promote and glorify influences or influencers that degrade Christian values. Uh, the enemy would eliminate biblical teaching in schools. And just one more, the enemy would promote dependence and lessen the value of hard work. So those are just a few of the things that we covered last week. Um, and, and throughout the week, and you probably did this, I thought of several more. Like I was like, oh man, that was a good one. I should have said that one. Or, oh, but this was a really good one. And then I even had some of you guys say to me afterwards, you know what would have been a good one is this. Or I was going to raise my hand, but you know, I didn't really want to. And, and a lot of you guys came in with some really good suggestions um, as well. But the best one that I heard is this. And as soon as I heard it, I went, that's next week's message. Right there, just that very single one. That's the message for next week. I knew it. It was on my drive home, uh, and I was talking to somebody, and they said it, and I was like, God, that's it. That's what you want me to talk about next week. So here it is. The best one that I heard is, how would the enemy attack, distract, break down, or destroy a society? He would create a culture of apathy and complacency in our churches and in our individual faith. Ouch, right? We're going we're gonna to dig into this. So what does that mean exactly? What's a culture of apathy and complacency? Well, we, we, we kind of know what those words mean, but I, I wanted to really dig in deep. So I looked up the actual definitions of these words. So apathy is lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. Now, do you think the enemy wants to bring apathy into our faith lives? Yeah. 
a lack of interest, enthusiasm, or concern. And then complacency is this. It's self-satisfaction, especially when accompanied by unawareness of actual dangers or deficiencies. Complacency is thinking that everything is just fine in your walk, in your faith life, and not even realizing that you are in peril or you are in danger because you're, you're just unaware, you're just, oh, everything is just fine. So I, I believe with all of my heart, probably the most effective thing that the enemy does to draw us away from biblical values is to create and foster and help this sense of apathy and complacency in our churches and in our personal lives, in our faith lives. Um, I'm going to give you this quote in a second, but uh, the, the writer of this quote, he's talking about the single greatest cause of atheism. Now, now we could look at that and go, wow, the single greatest cause of atheism. And now these are not true, but the world would say, well, it's lack of evidence for the Bible. Or it's archaeological finds that disprove the Bible. Or it's science. Like science is just leaving the Bible in the dust. Or, you know, I mean, we have all of this evidence for evolution. And those are the biggest factors of atheism. All of those are not true, by the way. Actually, the Bible can hold its own and, and, and is completely congruent with science and archaeology and all of that. But he says this, he says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians. I bet you weren't expecting that, were you? He says, the greatest single cause of atheism in the world today is Christians who acknowledge Jesus with their lips, walk out the door, and deny him by their lifestyle. That is is what an unbelieving world simply finds unbelievable. Wow. Greater than any scientific finds, greater than anything else. It's us as the church. And we come here, we enter these doors, and we, 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 we do the church thing, and then we go right outside of those doors, and we blend into the rest of the world. And the world looks at us, and they're like, well, they're a Christian, and they have to abide by all of these rules, um, but they're just really doing the same things that we're doing, and, and there's really no difference, so they're just a bunch of hypocrites. Why would I want to be a part of that? And you know what? I can't blame them. Because when we're not living like God has called us to live, like, like modeling after Jesus, we just blend right into the rest of the world. And there is a broken dying world out there that we have to be, as Jesus says in Matthew 5, salt and light too. So here's a few examples. Maybe you'll, maybe you'll see yourself in one of these. So an apathetic and complacent Christian would lack interest, enthusiasm, and concern about their faith and be unaware of the danger of it. An apathetic and complacent Christian would be casual about their faith stifled in their growth and undisciplined in their personal study or their discipleship. An apathetic and complacent Christian would lack urgency in sharing their faith with their friends and family, much less the rest of the world. This one goes along with that one. An apathetic and complacent Christian would understand the value of evangelism, but do very little to advance God's kingdom. And lastly, an apathetic and complacent Christian would only be able to point to church or program attendance as the basis and bulk of their faith. Don't raise your hand, but did any of those sting a little bit? As I was writing those this week, I was like, ooh, I'm not doing that well. I'm not doing that one well. And it was a real eye-opener to me, like, in any way, am I living in apathy and complacency in my walk of faith? So I think that's the question for us. So last week and throughout this week, several people asked me if I got any pushback from my message last week. 
And, and it's, it's, it's churchy people asking me because what they're really asking is, hey, did you offend anybody with your message? Because you talked a lot about the world and a lot of people, they may have disagreed with some of the things that you said. And that's totally fine. And listen, if, if that's you, if you were here last week and that was you, I'm so glad you came back. This is the best place for you to be because you get to see what makes us tick. And you do not have to agree with everything that we say here to attend here. We want you to be here. We want you to feel welcome no matter how you feel. Um, but people ask me, did anybody get offended? Did anybody have a problem with any of the things you said? And to be honest, the answer is no. Nobody came to me and said, you know, I didn't like that thing. I didn't really agree with that thing that you said. Um, in fact, I got a lot of the opposite. You know, um, I had one guy say a really cool thing. He's like, I love how you're calling a spade a spade. So that was just a cool compliment that I got last week. Um, but admittedly, I'm talking about church and Bible things to a bunch mostly, not all, but mostly church people, right? So I'm kind of shooting fish in a barrel, as we like to say. I'm talking about churchy things to church people. Most everybody is going to agree. But don't worry, church people. I am an equal opportunity offender. <laughs> so I'm going to actually talk to us today. So if you are not one of those churchy people and that you're here today and like a friend brought you, this is actually a really cool week for you to be here because I, I, I get to hold us all accountable as to what we're supposed to be doing and what we're supposed to look like and how we're supposed to be modeling after Jesus. And you get to hold us. You get to say, you know what? No, 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 no. You're not living that thing that you say that you're supposed to be living. So if we know the enemy would attack, distract, break down, or destroy a society by creating a culture of apathy and complacency in our churches and in our individual faith lives, here's the big question that we need to ask. How do you know if you're apathetic or complacent in your faith or you ask yourself how do i know if i am apathetic and complacent in my faith that's the question that we all need to be asking ourselves how do i know is there some part of me and i i i've just got to tell you i struggled with this this week is there some parts of me or some areas in my walk of faith that i i have been a little bit apathetic or complacent in my walk of faith. So to answer that question, there's actually two glaring answers that came out of me. One, church people, if I gave you about three or four minutes to just really think about it, most of you would probably come to answer number one. I'm just going to give it to you. We're going to cover it real quick because that's kind of the obvious one. How do you know if you're lacking in some areas? How do you know if you are uh, experiencing apathy or complacency? Well, Galatians 5, verse 22 and 23 gives us what? Anybody know? What, what is that? The fruit of the Spirit, right. So as followers of Jesus, we believe that there's like this part of God living inside of us called the Holy Spirit, right? That there's like, like a lot of people like call it a conscience or something, and it's like, the guide that we have within us to help us make the right God-honoring decisions. So it's that part of God that lives inside of us, and if that's true, if we're a true follower of Jesus, if we're truly a Christian, there is fruit that we ought to be bearing. There are some things that just ought to be coming out of us that are just kind of natural. Now, please don't misunderstand me. As Christians, this doesn't mean that everything is always perfect. Everything is awesome. Anybody with kids watch the Lego movie? Okay, just me. It doesn't mean that everything is always perfect. But it means as we walk through life and as we experience very, very difficult things, that there's just this odd sense of peace that we can still have. It's still difficult. It still hurts. It's, it's miserable. I, I don't want to live in this anymore, God. But, but there's just still this little sense of joy that's inside of us that just doesn't go away. That's the fruit of the Spirit. 
that God offers us. So, how do you know if you're experiencing apathy or complacency? You're not displaying the fruits of the Spirit. So, so what is the fruit of the Spirit? Well, uh, Galatians 5.22, but the fruit of the Spirit is, here's our list, love. And what do we say all the time? Love is a verb, not a noun. Love is something that you do, not something that you have. So if we are loving people, we are verbing people, it is an action that we are supposed to take. So, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. If I could bottle up and sell joy, not happiness, because you can buy happiness. And if you're like, no, money can't buy happiness, sin can't buy happiness, you're not doing it right. Okay? <laughs> money and sin can buy happiness, but it can't buy joy. That is something that only comes for the Lord. So if, if I could bottle up like joy and peace, I would be a rich man. Because you can't find those out in the world. They only come from God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. And Paul, you had to put this last one in there, self-control. Don't raise your hand. Anybody got a problem with self-control? Yeah, no, nah, me neither. Okay, so that's the fruit of the Spirit. That's things that we ought to be displaying. Now, this is just a freebie answer. This is not the sermon, but this is a really good clue as to if you are experiencing apathy and complacency in your life. But everybody got a Bible? There's a Bible right in front of you. Turn to James chapter 1. James 1. James is probably my favorite book of the Bible. Um, ladies, just a little promo. Uh, next week, Nikki is starting the new uh, women's study in the book of James, Mercy Triumphs. That's Tuesday nights. You don't want to miss that. It is a phenomenal study. Uh, it's done right back in here on the first floor in the kids' room. Uh, I think it starts at 6 o'clock. You don't want to miss it just for the ladies. Sorry, guys. We got something coming up for you. But I love the book of James. That was just an advertisement to give you time to get to James, Hebrews, James, and it's almost right at the end of the Bible. So James chapter 1. Now, the book of James, I love it. It's a very short book, but like you've got some writings from Paul and some other writings in Scripture, and, and it is a little bit drawn out at times. Nothing wrong with that, but it's drawn out. James, it's just like like repeatedly punching you like a punching bag. You know that, do, 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 like that's just James coming in with truth after truth after truth. And that's why I love the book of James. But he, he starts in verse 19. He says, my dear brothers and sisters, which means he's talking to believers, okay? He's talking to fellow Christians. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. So he's saying, this is important. You might want to write this down. This is something that you really need to know. Take note of this. Everyone, now what does everyone mean? It means everyone. Okay, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. That kind of goes along with that self-control thing, right? And slow to become angry because, here's the reason why, human anger does not produce the righteousness that God desires. I love that James says, be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. I, I, I love the saying, God gave us two ears and one mouth so we can listen twice as much as we speak. Anybody else ever heard that before? That's really, really good advice, isn't it? Verse 21, therefore, which means the reason why I said that is this, therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent, which that's what we've been talking about. That's what the world is trying to throw at us. Get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. That's the gospel. Remember, he's talking to believers. He's saying, that gospel, that good news, like you were a sinner dead in your sin. You weren't just a little bit dirty. You were dead, and Jesus came here. He didn't just clean you up a little bit. He made a dead thing, and he brought it back to life, and that's you, and that's me. So that word, that gospel that is planted inside of us, that word, that God's word, that thing that we're supposed to be hiding in our hearts so we don't sin against God, that word, accept the word planted in you. Oh yeah, and by the way, James throws out there, 
which can save you. That's the gospel. Hold fast to it. Hide it in your heart. And then here he goes, verse 22. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Now, that, 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 that merely listen to the word just means in one ear and out the other. Don't, don't just, okay, I heard it. Okay, great. And then go back out into your life and live your life just how you were living it before you heard the word. And, and hearing the word, it could be right here in a church service like this. It could be in your personal devotion time when you hear the word. It could be in your life group. It could be a prompting by the Holy Spirit, like, like that thing, you, I know I'm not supposed to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway because it's going to feel good or because it's going to advance my business or because it's whatever, fill in the blank. That's that hearing the word, but just, just kind of listening to it, not actually doing it. And he says, do what it says. Now, here's where it gets a little bit pointed. Here's where James is so good at saying something and then giving us this visual, this, this, this tangible tool that we can look at and go, oh, okay, I understand where you're going with that, James. So he says this, verse 23, anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in a mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Now, that's not overly condemning, right? Because, you know, we have mirrors and sometimes we have mirrors all over our house and we, you know, we, we go up into the mirror and, you know, sometimes we're intently looking, you know, looking to see if we've got pimples or, you know, if we, you know, if we got any makeup on from last night, that's just for the ladies, and, you know, or, and, you know, just like we're looking, sometimes we look intently, sometimes we walk by like... Yeah, you got it, bro. You know, sometimes we do that. I mean, I don't do that. I know some of you guys do that. But, like, but this is describing somebody that is looking in the mirror, like, like studying. That's what this is talking about. But you study what you look like, and then you walk away from the mirror, and it says, and immediately you forget what you look like. Now, so I was thinking about this. I was like, this is a very interesting example, James. What are you getting at here? And I started thinking, what would be the best way? Like, if you could describe this in one word of looking at a mirror, studying yourself in the mirror, and walking away and forgetting what you look like, what would be one word that would best describe it? Give me, give me some examples. Deny? Okay, what else? How about worthless? It's just worthless. You stopped, you spent time, you looked at the mirror, you studied yourself, and you walked away and you totally forgot your time was worthless. And you see where James is going with this? Verse 25. But, remember, we got to look for these words. This means, okay, instead of that, but watch this. But whoever looks, what's that word? Intently, like studying, there's that thing again. Whoever looks intently, looking with purpose, looking with intent, looking with a reason to change. And now James is, is kind of like shifting from the mirror back to the word. And he says, whoever's looking at God's word intently, like with the reason to change, and he says, into the perfect law that gives freedom. Not like, okay, th this is a bunch of do's and don'ts in here, and we just have to follow those, and if we get most of them right, we'll be okay. No. This is God's amazing word to us, and, say, and he says, hey, listen, I know you think you know how to live, but let me just tell you, if you follow my word, it's going to be so much better. 
No, 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 just don't look at it like a bunch of do's and don'ts. Look at it like I have set up life in a way that if you follow my word, it's going to be so much better. And, and there's a word up there. It says, what's it going to give? Freedom. Freedom from what? Yes. Freedom from everything. It's this freedom that we have that we live and we feel free because we are living in God's word. But whoever looks intently into the perfect law that gives freedom and continues in it, not forgetting what they have heard, but doing it, and it's, he, he, just, he keeps kind of saying this thing. It's like, listen, if you look at God's word and you see what it says or you hear it preached or you see it in your devotion, you hear it in your life group, the Holy Spirit kind of speaks it through you. If you hear that thing and you do it and you continue in it, there's going to be a result. What's the result? They will be blessed in what they do. Again, you don't have to raise your hand, but does anybody want to be blessed in what you do? Uh, yeah, sign me up for that. I want to be blessed in everything that I do. And this isn't just talking about, you know, money or stuff or you get a bigger house or a shinier car. That's not what this is talking about. This is talking about living life no matter what with the peace and the joy and the blessing that only God can bring. They will be blessed in what they do. You'll be blessed in following God's plan for your life, bringing honor to him through your actions. You're blessed with opportunities to share God's love to others. You're blessed with the relationship with Jesus. There's an R word that comes up every single week. And you're blessed with a life of joy, comfort, peace, gentleness, and patience. Watch this. Even in the midst of unavoidable calamity. You are blessed with those things even in the middle of it. Sign me up for that. What do I need to do to get that? That's what I want in a Savior. Not a bunch of do's and don'ts, but this perfect law of freedom that he gives. If you want to know the earthly, real-time benefit of a relationship with Jesus, that's it. Like, in this life, we get to experience joy and peace better than you can ever imagine. Blessing beyond what you can ever imagine. And again, I'm not talking about stuff. I'm talking about the blessing and the peace and the joy and the comfort and the safety that God our Savior brings. <laughs> and the funny thing is, now, like, I, I could probably throw it out there, like, Anybody not want that, and there would be nobody in this room that would raise their hand. Like, everybody wants that, but here's the thing. All of this is just the earthly benefit of a relationship with God. Like, and, and, and I even try to think about it, and my puny little human mind sometimes can't even think, yeah, also, there's this eternal benefit that we get. Like, we get to spend eternity with God? Like, like the, the, the pearly gates and the streets of gold and the thousand-year feast, which I'm really looking forward to that, and like, you know, all of this crazy stuff that we read in Scripture, like, do we really get to experience that? Uh-huh. So why would you not want, number one, like we said, a, a life of joy and peace and comfort and, and, and like this, this blessing that God brings as well as an eternity of that with him. That's what we get. But guess what? As followers of Jesus, you know what we're called to do? You know what God says, hey, here's, here's the reward, here's the end result, but, but, but what do you need to do while you are on this earth? Look intently into the law that brings freedom and do it. So it's this kind of a calling us out, and I'm, I'm saying us because I'm putting myself in that. That as followers of Jesus, we've got something pretty awesome, don't we? In this life and the next. And we need to bring that to a broken and dying world 
But when we leave these doors, are we really acting like salt and light in the world? Or are we just kind of blending in? I wrote this down. We get to have a personal relationship with a God of extreme mercy, unbelievable grace, and unexplainable love. Yeah, sign me up for that. That's, 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 that's it right there. Not there's this you know, higher power in heaven, and you know, maybe he got the whole earth started you know, back in the day, but you know, he's kind of old, and he doesn't really have anything to do with it now, or you know, he's just a, a policeman you know, with a big stick up there ready to whack us every time we do bad or anything. No, 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 no. We get to have a personal, not just kind of ethereal, but a personal relationship with a God of extreme mercy, unbelievable grace, and unexplainable love. That's unfathomable. And that's what God is offering to us. And he's saying, but I've given you some instructions. I need you to follow it because guess what? This isn't just a message you get to keep inside of you and you get to like hog it. It's not a come and see gospel where everybody comes in here and hears it. It's a go and tell gospel. It's a gospel that we have to go out of these doors and live like salt and light. Why wouldn't you want to follow that God? That's an awesome God, but we've got a mandate as followers of Jesus. So you think you can Christian. You think you can do this life of faith. You, you, you think that you know what God's word says? Then we need to do it then we need to obey it. It's very, very clear. We don't get to hog this message. We're called to go share it with the world. Amen? Let's pray. God, thank you for your love and grace. That just crazy, unexplainable love and grace and mercy. And, and God, we mess up so much. God, we, we sometimes knowingly sin against you as followers of you, but you still pour out grace and you still pour out mercy and you still pour out love and you still desire relationship with us. Thank you, God, that you're a forgiving God. As he sang a little bit ago, God, help us to come to you Help us to bring our sin and our burdens and all of our junk to you and say, God, I can't carry this any longer. I want to give it to you. That, that life of joy and peace and self-control and, 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 and comfort and all of those things, God, I want that. Help me not to do this life of faith by myself any longer. Help me not try to earn your favor and God, help me to wake up every morning knowing that your favor has already been poured out on me. Maybe you're here this morning or attending online and you've never started that relationship with Jesus. You, you've always thought, nah, I don't really believe that stuff or God doesn't really sound good or you've, you've relied on your church attendance or you've relied on grandma's faith or you've relied on your giving or you've relied on something else and you don't have a true relationship with Jesus this morning. I want to give you that opportunity. If that's you and you say, you know what, I, I, I want to get this right. I, I want to give my life to Jesus to experience that. Would you just say this after me? Just say, God, I need you. God, come into my life. I know I'm a sinner. And I know I need your son, Jesus, to wash away my sin. God, I give my life to you. Lord, save me. Change me. Heads are still bowed, eyes are closed. If you said that this morning for the first time, I would love to know. I'm not going to call you out or cause any attention, but I, I just would love to pray for you. Would you just slip your hand up 
You say, I got that right today. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? Today I started a relationship with Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. God, again, we come before you this morning. We're so grateful and thankful for all that you do. That you are a living God. That you are a God of second, third, and thousandth chances. God, help us to look at your word and to do what it says. Because it is the perfect law that gives freedom. God, break our chains. Break our chains of sin and addiction and all of the junk that the world throws at us. And help us to be the followers of you that you have called us to be. Lord, we pray for this time of offering. God, help us to use it in an awesome way that furthers and propels your kingdom. And God, help us to share your gospel, your good news of your amazing love to this world. Lord, we praise you and thank you, and it is in the awesome name of Jesus that we pray. Amen.